So we start the panel. So the, so the theme of the panel is basically um, how do we make sure that we have like uh, universal networks and affordable networks. Like the idea is that we, we want to have good connectivity in all places in a given territory, let's say France or region France or somewhere else. And uh, how can this happen? So as you may be seen from the previous presentation, Private operators that are not really keen to invest in this area, in the remote areas, because it's not very profitable. Um, so the two aspects we'll cover today will be like, um, yeah, two approaches, public networks um, and community networks. And so we'll see, um, we'll try to discuss, uh, do, they, do they solve the same problems? Uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages of each approach? And can they work together? So, yeah, that's it. So we'll, um, I will ask each of you just to introduce yourself, uh, the organization you represent, just in yeah, one minute or something. So okay. Julien. So, hello everybody. Thank you for inviting me today. I am Julien Delmouy, uh, Deputy Delegate General of a uh, federation called uh, Infranum. I am the twin brother of uh, Ariel that uh, you saw previously. Uh, he's representing local collectivities and I'm representing uh, operators and all the industry working for these local collectivities. So uh, my job is to work on a private-public partnership. Uh, my name is Adrian. I'm a member of a community network uh, in this area. Uh, called Francien.net and I'm also involved in uh, the Federation FDN which was uh, presented uh, this morning. So just so you a quick reminder, it's a federation of do-it-yourself ISPs in France uh, which has around uh, 4,000 members and 3,000 subscribers. So uh, it's a federation in France and Belgium. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Hello, sorry for being again here talking. I'm my partner, Antoniadis. I co-founded an organization called Nethood. And I'm here because I was the dissemination leader of a European project called Net Commons, through which I got in contact with many different community networks in Europe, but also in discussions in the European Parliament with regulators about the legal framework for supporting or not community networks. And I will try to give you an overview. Hi, uh, I'm Pedro. I'm part from the Giffinet community. I'm a member that did works as volunteer and as a professional. Uh, I'm involved, progressively involved since to 2011. Huh? Uh, to 2011, sorry. Uh, and I'm also part of Exo.cat, that is a non-profit ISP based on Barcelona. Thank you. And I'm part of the Federation at the end also, but I will just ask questions. <laughs> um, okay, so the first question is, uh, Julien, I will ask you to present in more details what Infranum is, uh, what are your actions, uh, what are your, your members, what do they do? Um, yeah, starting from this. Okay, so Infram, Infranum is um, a lobby, so we do two things. We, uh, we lobby government, just as Ariel do, and um, we also make our members meet together. Uh, we have 200 uh, companies um, working for local uh, collectivities. Uh, we are accompanying local collectivities in uh, their digital infrastructure. And what we uh, understand by um, uh, digital infrastructure is uh, creating networks uh, until uh, collecting data and treating data. So you have people doing civil engineering, uh, making cables, uh, selling uh, equipments, uh, like uh, Nokia, for example. Uh, you have, of course, uh, study bureau. Uh, you have uh, operators and uh, people uh, who work with uh, data and smart city. We have um, many occupations, but uh, I would say that uh, we were born with the national uh, broadband plan. 
so we are basically working with the fiber operators the one the ones that Ariel talked uh, about before uh, but we also are working with the wireless solutions uh, everything uh, for fixed position which means that we don't do mobile networks but uh, we for example do satellite or uh, what we call TG radio which is the evolution of uh, WiMAX we also do uh, Wi-Fi um, but all that we do is placed under the view that we do it for local collectivities so for example we just uh, launched a few minutes ago a new guide uh, concerning Wi-Fi wi um, which explains collectivities how to do uh, what we call uh, territorial Wi-Fi which is uh, um, just putting Wi-Fi in, in the streets and collecting data about uh, people and making uh, advertisement about uh, municipalities and so on. So it, it's just an example. We also have a specific focus on uh, business markets. Um, we are working on smart city and data. Uh, we are working on employment because we need a lot of resources to, uh, to roll out the fiber everywhere and uh, we work on regulation and lots of subjects. So it's globally, uh, we work on uh, digital uh, infrastructure. So there is uh, in France what we call the national broadband plan, which divides the territory into two segments. The first one is the profitable one, where operators go without any public aid because it's profitable. And the other one is the one where uh, help is needed uh, by public financing and this financing is either state financing either local collectivities financing and it's half half so of course the more you go into remote areas the more you need financing and so far uh, in France there is uh, 36 million households uh, contracts are signed for 33 of them and it lacks still three millions the the three uh, most difficult um, uh, plugs that still need financing so Ariel and myself are working so that uh, the state uh, reopens the, um, the the office that gives the finance for these last three million people otherwise they will get um, nothing so we on, we do not only do fiber fiber is uh, contracts are signed but it will not happen everywhere until at least 2025 in France um, and 80 percent of the territory by uh, 2022 but we cannot wait until 2025 to give um, very high speed broadband to everybody so that's why we are doing uh, complementary uh, technologies <coughs> like uh, THD radio satellite and Wi-Fi but that we consider more as part of the smart city than uh, than uh, other other thing, but uh, um, we can see like with the approaches like you do in FFDN that it's also bringing broadband to to people who don't have it. So it's the same state of mind. Okay, thank you. Um, so can you talk a bit more maybe about the um, RIP, uh, FTTH, uh, public initiative networks, specifically like how, um, how many infrastructure operators uh, are there, um, what kind of funding they get, uh, how fast they deploy network, this kind of uh, thing? Okay, so um, public initiative networks represent 45% uh, of the of the population, but 80% of the territory. Um, it's composed of um, six or seven operators, so they are the ones that you already know, plus some ones that you don't know for the infra infrastructure part, because they are only active on the wholesale market. So people like Covage, Action, uh, Altitude Infrastructure, uh, or names, uh, or brands that you don't know uh, when you are a consumer. Uh, but they are the people who build the networks and then they make offers uh, so that um, uh, ISPs can give service directly to, to customers. 
Okay. So, Adrien, uh, do you want to talk a bit about uh, the FFDN side of this kind of public <coughs> network? So, is it accessible for very, very small ISPs? What are the conditions and so on? Um, usually, we have trouble accessing uh, such infrastructure. Uh, the main reason is that uh, we have, we don't have easy contacts with uh, the groups that manage uh, them. We try to ask, ask them for contracts, uh, at least to know uh, what the offers were. And um, answers were usually um, quite long to come. Uh, I think that sometimes they never came. And when they came, we had um, separate issues, well, we have separate, se several kind of issues. Uh, the first one being that there were no bitstream offer, meaning that if we wanted to use anything on these networks, we had to put our own equipment in every place. And uh, that means dozens and dozens, uh, if not hundreds, or actually quite a lot more, um, switches uh, to put everywhere across the department, which is uh, probably like 100 kilometers wide. Uh, so way too costly for us. And um, hopefully there are some, also some um, uh, whips where we can have b offers, but then um, there are uh, upfront costs which are usually quite high. Um, and that gives us a recurring cost per plug, per, per subscriber, which, are, which can be quite high too. And when you uh, look at the numbers, usually, you usually need 100, more than 100 plugs and subscribers in order to become profitable just on the fiber side. Mm -hmm. um, that means that if you get subscribers but a bit slowly do, during the year, you're going to lose money for at least one or two years. Uh, that can be quite a lot of money. And you need fairly deep pockets to start operating there. Um, there's one place where, where we've managed to uh, get something doable. But uh, I, I'm not completely up to date with uh, the state, but I think it it took uh, several months uh, in order to get answers and to get the, uh, the stuff going, uh, unfortunately. So we don't always get these easy uh, relationships with uh, groups because we, we don't have the large name which says Orange and yeah, we, you, large telcos have it quite a bit easier on that side. So maybe, Julien, uh, on the, um, because when we talk about a lot of money, a lot of, a lot of subscribers, uh, it depends on your point of view. Yeah, because for us, 100 subscribers, as Adrien said, is already quite a lot. But at the level of a whole region, it's like nothing. So Julien, what, what do you think about the scale? Um, how many subscribers make sense so that the uh, infrastructure operator will want to talk to an ISP? Um, First, maybe I would say it's very uh, important to understand that the wholesale market is composed of uh, different, uh, different uh, scales of wholesale market. There is first the passive market, which is accessible only if you are a very, very big operator and actually accept Orange and SFR. It's not possible to make something sustainable with this level of wholesale market. So that's, uh, that's the basic. And then there is the active market, which is very important uh, and we are fighting uh, so that uh, there is uh, active offers everywhere in France. It's not the case on every uh, RIP, but it's almost the case. Uh, except if I'm wrong, it's only the case of one or two orange RIP. But still, it's not normal, and we are fighting so that it becomes um, the case everywhere. And then, of course, there is this notion of uh, what is an uh, efficient operator. I, I say it like that because um, 
uh, it's the term that is employed by the European Commission and the, and the French guidelines come from the European Commission. So it's exactly what you say, but it's, it's, a, it's a question of a point of view. From your point of view, 100 access is a lot. Uh, from the point of view of an operator which is selling hundreds of thousands of lines every, every year, they have calibrated their teams to negotiate with um, certain types of companies uh, uh, and these companies uh, often have a range uh, starting uh, at a higher level than uh, uh, 100 uh, of, of lines. That being said, you have solutions. First, uh, it's your role to, to try to, to make them uh, make direct good offers to you. Um, but there is also the possibility to go through another level of wholesale market uh, using uh, a bigger operator, which makes you lose control, of course, of the, of the value chain. But when you are small, maybe it's a good idea to, to start with a partnership. And then when you are big enough, then you can come back to the lower level of uh, investment. Uh, you can also try to group yourself uh, and maybe it's one role that could your federation have to make uh, um, this uh, lacking um, uh, level in the, in the value chain. And also there are some offers uh, which are available. That's not the most sat satisfactory one. Uh, it's the, what we call um, marque blanche, je sais pas comment on dit ça. White box uh, offers? Direct else? reselling of existing yeah. offer. You take a commercial offer and uh, you sell it with your logo, but actually it's not your offer. So that's a way to begin. And then when you have your 100 or your 500 access, you can come to the level of investment. But what you are asking is uh, for the um, directly for the for a low uh, level of investment on the scale of investment uh, that's normal that you try it and that's normal that you cannot gain it easily but there are solutions so Adrien uh, we already group ourselves a bit in order to um, uh, be able to access um, such markets um, but we still have an issue with the fact that we are quite naturally slow to gain new subscribers in a given area uh, due to the nature that of, our, of, the, of our networks and our community networks. So we have that thing that makes us lose money for one or two years at least. Um, depending on how much might be possible to do it or not. And uh, there have been a... As far as I know, it's been a bit difficult to get uh, these intermediate accesses um, because it's not always uh, very, I mean, economical for the unsubscribers. Uh, sometimes we end up with contracts that are quite a lot more expensive than what the large telcos can do. And when we're asking for like 10 or 15 euros or more, uh, of difference uh, to our subscribers, they tend to avoid it. And when you have to pay for 50 euros a month for your internet connection, people start to drop off and it blocks them from doing that. And as for white box offer, is that the correct term? Um, we have usually we try to not do the same kind of offers as uh, larger players because we want to do the, the things like self-hosting, giving public IP v4, um, everything that is related to self-hosting becomes much more difficult with such offers. Mm -hmm. And we don't have the, there are port filtering, dy dy dynamic IPs, uh, no reverse DNS for mail hosting, um, that blocks quite, that Will it prevent us from using this? Okay. Um, maybe you know we can talk a bit more about um, 
like really remote areas, like um, where there's no fiber yet, there will be no fiber in five years, maybe. So um, how do we handle these uh, this areas where there is nothing and there will be nothing for some time? Uh, Wi-Fi, public Wi-Fi, community Wi-Fi, what do you think? Wi-Fi is a solution, uh, and you prove it. <laughs> Um, we have identified um, in our uh, observatory that there are 2.2 million households which will not get um, very high speed broadband still in 2022. So that means that we have to do something for them. So our point of view is that um, what is called uh, fixed 4G doesn't work because it's actually the mobile 4G with um, with just more subscribers, but these are not the, the same type of subscribers. Because when you are on your telephone, you are checking the internet or your mails, it doesn't uh, take a lot of bandwidth. But if you use the same 4G uh, and you start uh, looking for Netflix or uh, very uh, um, uh, consummating uh, services, of course, the, the bandwidth on the, on the whole uh, coverage of the antenna will fall down and there is no control on this. So, despite what the government is doing, and it's doing it these days, uh, we think that it's a bad solution. We think that a better solution is what we call THD radio, which is actually also LTE which means 4G, but it's a different protocol which allows to control the number of clients, to control the bandwidth for every client and to adapt. But to exploit uh, this kind of um, technology, you need licenses and licenses are up to government. So we fought a lot uh, three years ago to get these licenses at no cost. We got it. But now the government is trying to close it. And we think that it's very damageable because there is no other solution for, uh, for clients. There is one more solution, which is satellite. But we all know that uh, the satellite, which is over France, is full. There is no more bandwidth on it uh, by now. It's coming again in 2020 or 2021, I don't remember. And then there will be a very high speed bone band with satellite again, with uh, the limitations due to uh, latency, but it's, it's, it's okay. But so we think that there are these two solutions, um, THD radio and satellite. And of course, there is still uh, fixed 4G, but as I said, I don't believe it's a good uh, solution. Wi-Fi is another solution, but there are um, only a few access which are concerned by this kind of uh, accesses right now. So, so maybe there is a market for you. <laughs> Adrian, about uh, Wi-Fi? Um, yeah, so um, we, as you mentioned, we do uh, Wi-Fi in some uh, areas and uh, some of some members of the federation have managed to cover quite large areas uh, or cities quite densely. So we indeed prove that uh, it's, a, it's one solution. We, but at the same time, whenever we can, we also try to use fiber. Um, at that point, we have usually the, our issues are kind of the same as with Wi-Fi. It's, we need access to either um, the, well, the ducts and places to put fiber or uh, high locations in order to put Wi-Fi antennas so that we can reach places which are 10 kilometers away or sometimes more. Um, we've also probably seen kind, kind of the same issue as you've mentioned last. We need frequencies for that. When we do 5G, uh, 5 gigahertz for Wi-Fi, we have two issues. First, when we cross cities, we have interfer interferences with uh, anyone who wants his own uh, Wi-Fi uh, access point. And we also have issues with airports. If we have one airport in the line of sight of a Wi-Fi access point, we can be 
quite annoyed uh, as it can cause trouble for um, what else. So we'd like to get access to other frequencies, but uh, we know that at the same time, large telcos try to get new frequencies, they say for 5G, and they say that they need it uh, for 5G or they won't manage to deploy anything, which we don't believe, of course. Um, so yeah, we do have some of the same issues. Uh, we'd like to do more, just like you, I think. And um, yeah, if I don't know if we could work together on that point, and if you have some places where you think uh, community network networks could deploy Wi-Fi, but I think that's another question. We also do um, Wi-Fi, but we consider it as a um, com complement, uh, not as uh, a service for somebody who would have nothing. Uh, we really think about it as a territorial, complementary ser service, something that is offered to tourists or to uh, students or to people who need uh, because they are uh, mobile. Uh, some um, punctual access, but we don't use it as you do for uh, permanent mm. access. Yeah. Just, just to point out that I think that there is a little misunderstanding here because what, what you're talking about, if I understand right, is that you are doing trunking via, via Wi Fi. So you, you're bringing bandwidth somewhere where there is nothing that goes there. While in your case, you're talking about access which is something that comes after you bring bandwidth there. So you were mentioning places where not even in 2022, they're gonna have fiber, which basically means that they will never have fiber. And you have to bring bandwidth there before you distribute it. And what they're doing is they're using Wi-Fi to bring bandwidth there mm -hmm. and, not to off and not only to offer it to, to, to the last, to, to, to the users. Just to, I think there was this little misunderstanding. Uh, was I right? I'm not sure to understand. No, uh, so, so basically, it's a distinction between backhaul, like how do you connect an area to the to a central location uh, that connects, uh, which yeah you mostly do with fiber or long distance links, Wi-Fi links, is that it? And then how do you so that brings like uh, connectivity and bandwidth to a location, and then you have to distribute it. Oh, I'm talking the, about distribution too. Exactly, yeah. but I, I think he was talking more about uh, backhauling. Ah, so, okay. yeah. If we can Sorry. do, because what we usually do is we cross large distance uh, with Wi-Fi, because we cannot do with uh, we cannot do the same with fiber, either because we don't have the money or we don't have the accesses. Um, when possible, we do fiber, uh, but usually it would be afterwards. Mm -hmm. Um, so we would do like I don't know, 10 kilometers, 20 kilometers with radio, and then we can distribute it to the to the subscribers either with Wi-Fi or with cables, with anything we want uh, on it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, first we use Wi-Fi because it's much simpler to put. It's already uh, much better for subscribers who can enjoy probably, well, up to 100 or 200 megabits per second. And then, well, if fiber arrives one way or another, we're, we're quite happy to, to have people switch to it. But it's true that until fiber arrives, uh, we do get much better results by providing Wi-Fi-based links than nothing. Mm -hmm. And so, if but, but you have a frequency problem because to get Wi-Fi there, you are using frequencies that are really crowded. Yeah, indeed, uh, frequencies can be crowded. It really depends on the setups. We have different cases, and in some cases there's pretty much no one on the path. In other cases, especially when we start from a city, we have trouble. If we have a good link in a city. And we want to start our link from there to 20 kilometers away. We'll have to build because one or two kilometers, the first one or two kilometers of the way your link 
will be across uh, um, buildings of the city who will have their own 5G uh, access points. And that's enough to degrade the signal quality. So maybe on this um, backhaul and uh, distribution thing, um, Pedro, you want to talk about what you do with, with Giphy? So what we do uh, to to bring uh, the the backbone the backbone network in in lots of regions, no? You mean? Yeah. Um, so uh, in Giphy, uh, there's a lot of points of presence in different places of Catalonia, especially that is where Giphy is more intense. Um, and uh, we use a uh, uh, public de uh, deployment of optical fiber that later was privatized and is I think the, 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 this topic is in courts or something like that uh, it later came to um, Media Pro and later it was acquired by Celnex that is Avertis I don't know if this company is more important outside of Spain but inside of Spain this company manages a lot of um, uh, roads, uh, communications, towers, everything related to logistics. So, um, and Giphy Foundation, that it is the majority operator, uh, provides uh, internet for all the members that accept the Giphy license. And we, there we can find non-profit associations, cooperatives, for-profit companies, etc. Uh, through points of presence, to um, to a point of presence uh, means that uh, you have to have somehow like a data center and a rent of a optical fiber of high capacity. So for, for the back hole, for the, the back hole, yeah. Back to uh, access point or. From from there, it's like different points of presence that goes to the um, internet exchange in Catalonia called Catnix, Equinix, and from there, yeah, goes to the internet thing. So, the, I think maybe the interesting thing is that uh, Giphy, which is a non-profit uh, network, somehow, well. <laughs> But you, you are able it's to an use infrastructure. I mean, it's an the infrastructure is non-profit, but then on top of it, different members can work for profit. No. no. The, the, the infrastructure have common property. It's a common pool resource. So it's not public. It's not public. It's not private. It's common pool resource. The, this has advantages to to be competitive. So inside there's an ecosystem, economy ecosystem that works, but also it's uh, it's like public. So there's no restriction or exclusion to any member to participate. So Elinor Ostrom, economist, Nobel Prize, studied the, these models and we, we see that we are going this way. And it's better than public and private, but they are there and sometimes uh, things happen in terms of property or who owns the property. It makes sense. It, it's, uh, it's a mix of for-profit and non-profit associations. The Giphy Foundation is non-profit because then we could have a conflict of interest. The Giphy Foundation will be like the regulator, like the public regulator, like the what we, what the government should do. But the, and the government is another actor of all these that sometimes participates, putting budgets or putting um, certain services. Okay. Hmm? Make sense. Yes, I have understood it. Giphy has a backbone network that it's treated as common, so everybody that uses pays part of its cost, and this is why it's not profit because the sharing of the cost of the infrastructure is cost-based. But then people on top of this common infrastructure, they do different things. Others are completely non-profit, others are small ISPs. And I have a question for you. Um, do you make the same price everywhere? Do you use your whole organization to make the, the price be the same, even if you are on, uh, in an area with, where it should be higher in cost? Um, so 
Giphy Foundation established a minimum price to avoid dumping between operators. Sometimes there are conflicts related to that. Uh, depends on the zone. So now we are in a we are in a huge debate on what's going on because yes, it's a cost-based infrastructure, but but we are starting to mix it with a market cost infrastructure. So there's some operators that wants to put big streams inside the network at market cost, and this is incoherent what was before. But I mean, we are still on discussion about what's going on. And, and there's also another debate about having also n not solve problem about if we should uh, put a general price for everything or we should have different zones with different prices and in if you the concept of zone is very relative relative uh, the zones can be merged sometimes or be separated so is very right now is generic but different operators especially the for profit part that is the majority with the 90% of participation in the network are proposing to um, uh, fragment and I, I don't know if this is a strategy to do something else or it it matters the subject it depends whether you want to be profitable or whether you want to make uh, digital uh, uh, equality. Or it depends if you are trying to do financial engineering or whatever. I mean, we have a compensation system that uh, compensation means that there's a transfer of property of the assets of the network uh, between volume consumption and investment. So they, these for-profit operators try very hard to think how, can, how they can pay less. And so it's also a conflict of interest for them. Okay, we propose that, but you are proposing that because you need it, uh, because it's better for you or both, or what? Um, and some of the zones, they are the unique operators. So it's somehow a monopoly in, in the zones because they, um, merge it with all the operators in that zone or because they were the only one. So it's... I don't know if I asked it your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. Oh. Just... Uh, I work with uh, with Panos in, in the same project, and many of the things that uh, Pedro is, is, is telling, the, we would describe them. So if you're interested, I invite you to go to the project. It's called Netcommons, netcommons.eu. Okay. And you can ask me directly, just not to look to, through all the deliverables. But there are some that actually explain how the Giphy model works, and also other models uh, around Europe. Because it's really complex. I mean, it, it's hard to compress everything in, in a few words. But yeah, maybe something that is quite interesting is that um, our model in, in France is that the infrastructure is managed by um, yeah, public money but private uh, operator and then ISPs can operate on top of that and even non-profit ISP in some cases. While in your case, it's more like a community-run infrastructure and on top of this you have for-profit ISPs. You know, it's a, kind of the reverse. Yeah. Yeah? But we also uh, have the other model. Uh, okay. For example, the, the, mar the Spanish market is regulated, so the, mono the important operator that is Movistar uh, uh, is obligated to um, share its infrastructure. Uh, and this is called Neva, Neva Service. So it's a bit stream. Universal? Uh, Neva? Neva, okay. Well, <laughs> N-E-V-A. Um, it's like a standard of the government, or like the same. I think it's the same model for for France. So, so stream, uh, yeah. So it's like okay, we share the costs inside us, and what's outside, and what's outside. Uh, Giphy Foundation have a deal with some of these operators and share this contract with the internal operators. That this is what you have, no? Uh, what do you mean? Um, 
So for example, the, the Neva service, we are now experimenting with that pitch stream. So we are starting in EXO in our local association ISP to have this kind of fibers to try. And so we have to go through open, um, uh, so Giphy Foundation to, um, okay, we want one of these. So they have the bridge between the, it's a very complex uh, work uh, flow, but you know, uh, Giphy Foundation, Giphy Foundation goes to Neva, but yes, we also have the same kind of services as you uh, through this regulated service from the private part. Also with the transport links I mentioned it before, uh, the, that is called the Charcha Oberta de Catalunya, shock XOC, that in English would be like open network of Catalonia, but it's not open, it's, it was public, now it's pr privatized and owned by a corporation uh, that don't want to share the network. Let's, we will see what happens. So, we, I think we are touching all possible fronts to have good internet, good accessibility, good communications. I'd like to add something because you said um, public initiative networks were uh, public funded networks. It's not totally true. Actually, it's 80% private. So it's just 20% public and it's a difference. And these 20% have um, um, is an exchange. In exchange of these 20%, the property of the network at the end of the 20 or 25 years of exploitation come back to the local collectivity. And there are also obligations to give access to every provider in a neutral way and also to give active accesses. The error on this point was the first networks didn't get this clause in the contracts. So now we are making what we can so that it becomes uh, obligatory. But actually, that was a negotiation. And the first contracts didn't get the active clause. Uh, active is bitstream? Bitstream, yeah, sorry. No, I just. Uh, Okay. Um, do you want to add something, Thomas? Yeah, I could say a little bit about uh, yep. two. I, I, when you told me I was preparing to, to give you two photographs, let's say, from uh, our work with NetCommons, one is in Greece, that we have in total 20 ISPs, the whole country. It's very difficult. Three of them are friends, I think, Orans, and uh, some are universities. So it's very difficult to become an ISP in Greece. And there is a network in a remote area that is created completely from the bottom up with people putting antennas on the roofs, with an association that helps them without any formal. And we invited the regulator of uh, Greece the, to discuss this issue and uh, what is the legal status of such networks, why we don't encourage more of them to fill all these gaps. And the answer is that uh, we don't uh, want to know. I mean, uh, uh, we don't want to touch these things. We don't want to make them legal. We prefer to be in this type of gray zone because like this, somehow we can control them. You know, they cannot expand. And uh, the same discussion came in the European Parliament when uh, Ramon, one of the founders of Wi-Fi, it was a discussion about the co-investment uh, law of the telecommunications uh, and he was saying and uh, all people say, were saying community networks are too small we don't i mean there was i mean there, there was this pattern of okay do whatever you want but don't ask us to be explicit about this and this is what ramon was asking not only to allow them to exist but explicitly put in the co-investment law uh, that these are possible partners to make them more uh, known and legitimatize them because it's not only the reality of the law but how people feel about these things. They feel that they do something out of the sphere of the government and the private sector so they feel some sort of reluctant. I don't know how people react to your FFDN. Uh, uh, maybe they feel that it's some, something dangerous. Or, I don't know. <laughs> Anarchist or I don't know. Heavy metal. Uh, and uh, another image, a very interesting model that I think it's uh, 
Uh, it's interesting on the other side. It's very advanced. It's in the UK. It's called the network called Barn, which is a cooperative that actually laid down its own fiber. And uh, what stick to my mind was very interesting is that they reduced extremely the cost of the of the network infrastructure because all the people of the village, the, the area participated and the fiber passed through their uh, fields. It didn't pass through the main uh, roads that was very expensive to lay, but actually they really did, did it through their own land. I don't know exactly the legal aspects of it, but it's an interesting story of how you can actually literally do it yourself and lay down uh, fiber if you engage not only a few entrepreneurs or, or activists, but the whole community. And just to finish, this is an extra argument why these things are important, and we always insist in net commerce that it's not just filling the gaps, but uh, activating the community, uh, rising the digital, uh, let's say, emancipation, people feeling closer to all these things, understanding how they work. And I think this is not something to underestimate when we talk about community networks solving the connectivity problem. They do it not only cheaper, but are also in a more, uh, I don't know, emancipatory way, that it's very important also. Thank you, Panos. Yeah. Um, I think we will finish here, unless one of you has something more to add. the last word. No. Yeah, mm. but it's <laughs> a good conclusion, uh, I think. Yeah, Pilo? Uh, I wanted to add something. I mean, uh, one time, one guy from Ho the, the Holland come to, to Barcelona to explain how Wi-Fi became a reality. It was like a process of 30 years because nobody trusted him. No, Why you want to open the spectrum to everyone to do that thing? I think that Wi-Fi is a success. I mean, a period, um, community networks and a lot of things. So the solution is not to close the spectrum and do the Wi-Fi uh, and think of the past, no? Like, because 5G is proposing to close the, um, to have a lot of spectrum available to something what Wi-Fi should be. And what, what Wi-Fi needs is more spectrum. So it's a success. N now we need more spectrum and less regulations that affects negatively the, the, the available spectrum, like the DFS and so on. Because it works, and the the, the spectrum as a commons, it worked, and the license on, on the private part of the spectrum is a massive failure. That it, it just attracts speculators to move millions of of money for nothing. So, uh, just a comment. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I think we may, may have some questions. Yeah. Um, so I kind of wanted to follow up on the question of the person at the end of the previous panel. I don't know his name, but he, he was sitting over here and he made a comment towards the end, like, instead of having fines when the private sector has violations, why don't we force them to like collectivize those pieces or something like that? And there was like a pretty positive response in the room, I think, to that suggestion. So I apologize. Like I don't live in France, and I have like a very so I'm pretty ignorant about like it's what I know is just from like the news and stuff. And like what I've seen is like pretty impressive from my perspective, like from the U.S. Like pretty like massive mobilization of people in support of like the public sector in certain domains, right? Like. I see a lot of mobilization around people really coming out in defense of that. But I don't see that in telecommunications. And so maybe this piggybacks on your comment about like one of the affordances of community networks as being kind of like a large scale engagement and like an education and like getting people involved in like understanding the decision making and the politi the political process. But like I wonder if maybe any of you would want to think about like why it seems like there's a lot less public mobilization in defense of like public telecommunications and maybe like if the work of a lot of people here at Battle Mesh could maybe be more towards like work that would create that kind of involvement you know as a beyond just like building community networks but actually trying to get like m m much larger scale 
understanding and then support and then mobilizing to defend like the these like public deployments and stuff. Um, maybe I have a few answers and I will say <laughs> about uh, the same that's what I said before is that uh, we are criticizing a lot today but there are also good things working some don't we just saw it uh, a few weeks ago there are gilets jaunes uh, everywhere so one part of the uh, um, of uh, what they wanted also uh, being connected that's normal but um, what is also true is that in france we have a, a good copper network and that's why Fiber is, has started maybe a bit late in France, but now uh, we are um, we are supposed to get a fiber network deployed 80% everywhere in, in 2022, and generalized somewhere between 2025 and 2030. That's long, but that's a gigantic uh, infrastructure um, project. So. I would, I would say, uh, yes, there are things to do to make uh, the market better, but it's also a market which works correctly. That's sure that when it doesn't work at your house, you are not happy. Uh, if you live in a remote area, there is nothing working, and that's why it's important to get solutions for these people. But um, that's uh, a I don't like to say that that's a small part of the population because it's not that small. But um, compared to other countries and maybe compared to the US precisely, maybe the situation in France is not, not that bad. But we can do better. Just a speculation, it's also that uh, the internet in general is something that came uh, Recently, I mean, communities, etc., had more contact with the ground, the resources, etc., but the internet came somehow from the sky, and we are not used with the old ways to manage infrastructure. I mean, people have not this consciousness. I mean, uh, you know, there is the cloud, it's something magic, I don't know, in San Francisco, it's far. It was never, let's say, ours, and it's not only about the infrastructure, but also about the, so uh, the services. I think these are linked also to how people are alienated somehow with the politics of the internet because it, you know it's something like a gadget, not like a process. Yeah. But yeah. Um, I'd like to add something about that too because when we meet people uh, who are not part of a community network, quite usually the first thing we need to well teach them, explain to them, is that. Yes, you, anyone can be an ISP. Um, it doesn't have to be only the big telcos. Um, people are quite removed from uh, what uh, the internet and what telecommunications actually are. They think it's not something that they could get involved in, uh, that it's something which is absolutely not fit for the state, probably. I think it's, uh, it has to be something for the private sector, and they don't imagine that uh, it's just like anything else, like any other infrastructure. So I'm not that surprised that we have that difference, because people are just not used to it, unfortunately. Okay. Well, merci. <laughs> merci beaucoup. So thank you very much for all of you for participating. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I think Kiroma, you're, you're next, right? <laughs> um, so it, it will be a talk on...